Thank you very much. And I'm so excited to be able to talk to you guys today about senior pets. And we're going to discuss a little bit about how important it is that we realize that um, senior pets need the, the dental care um, too, especially probably even more so than, than younger ones. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, my slides aren't advancing. There we go. So one of my favorite quotes was actually um, by a veterinary dentist who's a, a friend of mine who actually <clears throat> said, age is not a disease. It's just a consequence of not dying. And I thought that was just so profound. And I, I actually, um, one of my um, things that I just cringe when I hear it is I'll talk to pet owners or, or people will say, hey, yeah, my dog's teeth are horrendous, but we can't do a dental procedure on him because he's just too old. And I'm like, well, I, I usually say this, age isn't a disease, it's just a consequence of not dying. Um, and when I compare it to, let's say your 90 year old grandmother, you know, falls and breaks her hip, um, are you not gonna try to do something to fix that? Are you just gonna let grandma be in pain because yeah, she's old, we don't really need to worry about that. So this is very similar to um, that situation and these pets are in pain and this is horrible, horrible infection that's getting into their entire body. And we're gonna talk about that as we go through this presentation. Now, this is a statistic that's out there. This is you know, from um, a little while ago, 2013, but 80% of all dogs and cats over two years of age have some degree of periodontal disease. Now, having talked to Dr. Nemec and other colleagues in veterinary dentistry, we actually think it's higher than that. We really feel that it's probably closer to 85 to 90% of pets have some degree of periodontal disease. And that might mean they just really, you know, you have just gingivitis, but that is the first stage of periodontal disease. And dental disease is something that is extremely preventative if we get the right care for that patient. Now we know there's roadblocks to veterinary care, especially in dentistry and, and many um, vets that I, go and teach with or, or talk with, they just didn't get any training in vet school. If they did, it was maybe a lottery system and they didn't win the lottery so they didn't get the dental course or they got just a couple weeks here and there, they got to clean three teeth and extract one um, kind of thing. And, and this is something that 80% of our patients or more have the disease and we're still really reluctant to talk about it and teach it. Now it's getting better. Um, the, the AVMA has just required dentistry to be a core requirement for vet schools in 2020. Um, but even in tech schools, it's still something that's kind of taught on the fringes sometimes. And this is something that a veterinary technician can really own short of doing the extractions. They can really own dentistry um, by doing the oral exams and, and um, cleaning the teeth and getting everything, placing the blocks. Um, can't do the extractions, that's oral surgery but they can do everything else. And we know that we just don't put enough emphasis on the importance of the oral cavity to the rest of the animal's health. Now we have to be able to recognize and we really need to think about dentistry as and dental disease as pain and infection. Okay, so I've got two pictures on this screen and both of those have what we like to refer to affectionately as pus oozing. Uh, out of those, those gums, that's an infection. And what people don't really realize is that the definition for periodontal disease is it's, excuse me, an infectious disease caused by plaque and the resulting inflammatory response. So the key there is it's an infectious disease and it's caused by plaque. Okay, we're gonna talk about what plaque is here in a minute, but it's caused by the plaque on the teeth, okay? And we don't really realize this, but this is painful. You know, dogs and cats are experts at hiding pain. They're gonna eat no matter what. Um, they're probably gonna do whatever they need to. They may hide from people if they're really painful. But having been in this field for almost 29 years now, I know that when we do clean up one of these two mouths, that patient is gonna be acting like a puppy again within just a few days after the procedure. So we know it's painful because suddenly they're not in pain anymore and they act really wonderful and have a lot of fun. Now, as I said, plaque. Plaque is the soft gelatinous mixture that consists of bacteria and the bacterial byproducts. Now, it also has salivary glycoproteins in it, obviously the bacteria, lipids, cellular debris, and polysaccharides in there. And the glycoproteins and the polysaccharides are what really cause the plaque to adhere to the tooth. 
And we're going to talk about how plaque kind of grows on the tooth, on the crown of the tooth, but it also grows up underneath the gingiva. It's important to remember, plaque will start to form on the teeth within about 20 minutes of a cleaning, okay? So if you just brushed your teeth, even you know this morning before you went to work, if you ran your tongue over your teeth right now, you're gonna feel kind of a slime layer. That is the first layer of bacteria or plaque on your teeth. So we have to make sure we realize that this forms very quickly. Now it's gonna lay down a pellicle first, but it does form very quickly. Now, if that plaque is not removed, Every 48 to 72 hours, it starts to calcify into calculus, also known as tartar for kind of the human um, word for it. But calculus itself doesn't really cause any issues. Um, it might cause a little bit of gingival irritation because it grows on the crown and below the gum line too. But really what it does is you can see on this picture, all those little nooks and crannies gives more area for more plaque. So the more surface area you have, the more plaque we have. The more calculus you have, the more plaque you have. And the only way we get calculus off is by removing it with this power scaler or hand scaler. Let's go back to plaque for a minute. As I said, it starts with that biofilm. It laid down within 20 minutes or so of a cleaning. And that's kind of that pellicle layer that has, you know, the bacteria, the saliva, the glycoproteins and things. We cannot remove plaque by just putting antimicrobials in the body. All right, that's not going to work. It just does not respond that way. We have to get in and remove that biofilm on a regular basis. And if we don't do that, we can have inappropriate host responses where we start having chronic infection. Because remember, periodontal disease is an infectious disease caused by plaque and the resulting inflammatory response. So we're going to have this kind of chronic inflammation that happens. And then on top of that, we start having a systemic impact on the host. So we're getting this inflammation in the mouth, but it starts to affect the rest of the organs. So what happens with the plaque is it starts to grow on the crowns of the teeth. And when it's growing on the crown of the teeth, it's aerobic bacteria. All right. But as it grows up underneath the gum line, the type of bacteria change because we have less oxygen available. So it becomes kind of facultative. And then as it gets even deeper, it becomes anaerobic where we don't need the oxygen. And when we get to this stage, that's when we start having these gram negative bacteria um, that really start to cause more and more pathological issues. So we look at these gram negatives, bacteria and spirochetes. Many of these are black pigmenting anaerobic bacteria, which means just bad guys, all right? They're really bad bacteria. And they're gonna start creating endotoxins. They're going to start putting off volatile sulfur compounds. So when you smell that dog with really bad periodontal disease, you kind of get that rotten egg smell. That is thiols that are being produced. And because of that chronic infection, that bacteria is putting off these sulfur compounds. In addition to that, we start getting proteolytic enzymes that are created. And what happens is the body um, wants to heal itself. So all the little neutrophils come to the area, but they're so overwhelmed, they end up becoming toxic neutrophils. And then they start to actually be part of the inflammatory cascade. So they're not there necessarily to help anymore. They become part of the issue. So we start seeing inflammatory cytokines being produced. And that's when we start seeing the destruction. And we see destruction in these patients where the first layer of destruction is just gonna be the epithelial tissues. That's when we have gingivitis, we start getting the epithelial tissues affected. But as we increase the sulcus depth or the depth between the gingiva and the tooth, then we get over that one to three millimeters in a dog or over a millimeter in a cat, we start having pathological pockets. And then on top of that, we start having damage to the periodontium, which includes the periodontal ligament, the alveolar bone, the cementum, as well as the gingiva. So we start having bone loss that is caused because of that periodontal disease. Now we know there's consequences to periodontal disease and we have local consequences. Those are gonna be things such as an oral nasal fistula where we have communication directly from the sinus to the, the mouth. We can have those pathological fractures where a small toy breed dog might jump off the couch, bump his chin on the floor and end up with a jaw fracture because there's just so much bone loss. We can have periocular damage um, 
maybe because of an abscess from a fractured tooth, or this is really kind of common in some of our brachycephalic dogs in relationship to periodontal disease. Of course, osteomyelitis can happen, that nasty bone infection that can start to happen, and then we get tooth loss. But what we also have to realize is that there's a systemic link to that infection. And every time that patient is eating, that bacteria is getting into their bloodstream and it starts to affect their kidneys and their liver and their heart. Now we know in humans, it's well documented that there is a link between periodontal disease and heart disease and other problems. We know there's a link between inflammatory bowel disease and, um, and the, the periodontal or microorganisms. We see it as a link in cardiovascular disease. We find these pathogens in the plaques in our arteries, as well as a risk for those who, you know, artery calcification, um, renal insufficiencies, it can be related to stroke or TIAs, as well as even the thickening of the wall of the carotid artery. Now these are well-documented in humans. There has been some data out there for veterinary to link the same uh, types of reactions. In 1996, Dr. Linda DeBose did a study on the association of periodontal disease and histological lesions in multiple organs in beagle dogs. Um, in 2005, there was a study that showed systemic effects of chronically infected wounds in the oral cavity. We also have echocardiogram changes in dogs with periodontal disease, as well as mitral valve endocarditis after a dental cleaning in a dog. So we have these things that happen and we know those same things happen in humans. Now there was a study that's, um, I think it's still in the works. I'm not hundred percent sure if it's completed yet, but um, in Colorado state, they were tracking the systemic parameters before and after treatment for periodontal disease. And what they found is that with the increasing severity of periodontal disease, there was an increased concentration of the markers for systemic inflammation. And as we would expect, that inflammation was reduced when they had appropriate periodontal therapy. Now, this is just a slide that really shows the stages of periodontal disease. And there's four stages, everything from just gingivitis, what we just have a little bit of red swollen gums, but there's no bleeding upon probing, or there might be bleeding upon probing, but we have no bone loss evident, okay? Stage two, we get to about 25% bone loss. Stage three is over 50%, up to 50%, and stage four is over 50%. Now, what's really important to remember here is that we can go ahead and draw a line in the sand, and we can make gingivitis is reversible. Stage one is reversible. With good dental cleaning and good home care, we can take a stage one back to a zero. But once we get to stage two, three, and four, we can't reverse it. We don't have to let them progress to the next level, but we can't reverse it. So we can go ahead and we can stop stage two at stage two, but we can't get that bone that's lost back. So this is just a really important progression chart to show that you know we do have four stages and where each one of those is. So what is the goal of treating uh, periodontal disease? We know, as I said earlier, that dental disease or periodontal disease is preventable. All right, we do it with ourselves all the time. Every day we brush our teeth once or twice a day. Um, we're getting our teeth cleaned on a regular basis. We are preventing periodontal disease, okay? So that's what our goal is. That's what we wanna do for our patients is to help them prevent getting the disease. We wanna maintain healthy oral, cap or oral tissues so we don't have them destroyed. We wanna remove that irritant, that biofilm, we need to get that plaque off because if we keep the plaque off, we're not gonna have calculus, okay? And we need to remove any granulated tissue. And if we do have periodontal pockets, we need to minimize their depth. Now, there is um, something going around the country and, and I'm hoping that um, you know this is something that is gonna be a passing fade, although it's been around for a while, a passing fad. Um, this is going to be anesthesia-free dentistry. And if you go to the 2019 AHA Dental Guidelines, you're going to see that we really do not recommend this. I have watched it being done in a patient. Um, that dog was extremely stressed. I think you, you cannot clean the lingual or palatal aspects of the teeth. You can't really get below the gum line. Um, it probably can only be done efficiently, maybe on stage ones in about 
one to 2% of the dogs out there. So it's not going to be very efficient because as a friend of mine who was on this, Dr. Heidi Lowprice said, if you, if you leave bacteria below the gum line, if you leave debris, you're leaving disease. So if you can't clean below the gum line, you might as well not even clean that pet's teeth. And you have to have the right equipment and the right tips on your scalers in order to clean below the gum line. But if you just clean the crowns, there's really no reason to anesthetize that patient because the disease and the infection is below the gum line. Now, some people, you know, still throw antibiotics at dentistry. Um, in fact, I was at a practice a couple of weeks ago where I was asked about the effectiveness of pulse therapy um, for antibiotics. And I'm like, just don't. <laughs> we in veterinary dentistry probably can't, most of the vet dentists can't remember the last time they prescribed an antibiotic. Um, when I started in this field, everybody got three days of antibiotics before a dental cleaning. Okay, that was just kind of the rule. We found out now that bacteremia that we were trying to prevent was very short lived, maybe about 20 minutes. Okay, and the body kind of clears it. Now, there are situations where we still might think about an antibiotic, and this is the veterinarian's choice um, before a dental cleaning, but that might be for a patient who's immunocompromised. I had a dog who had polyimmune mediated part excuse me, polyimmune mediated arthritis, I cannot talk today. Um, she would have probably, you know, had um, needed a dental cleaning, she would have had uh, an antibiotic beforehand. Those that are like the grade 17 out of four, those really horrible, horrible mouths, maybe we put them on an antibiotic, even if it's just an IV antibiotic just before the procedure. Um, sometimes a patient who has some kind of a comorbidity might benefit from having a broad spectrum antibiotic beforehand. Most people don't know, or most dentists can't remember the last time they gave one after a procedure. Because if we've done a good job of cleaning that mouth up, there's really no reason they need to have an antibiotic afterwards. Now, when it comes to doing dentistry on these senior patients, remember I said, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm really afraid to do it. My doctor says the patient's too old. Um, I have seen so many dogs that we have done this and cats that we have cleaned their mouth up and they might have only had a year or two left after that, but it was a really great year. They weren't painful anymore. They were feeling much better and they were just much happier. But we have to use three B's when we look at doing these senior patients. That means bravery. We don't want to let an animal suffer because we're afraid to do a dental procedure. All right. If you have a very severe case, and this may not be necessarily possible in shelters, but you know, refer, ask a vet dentist if they're able to do it because they're used to dealing with these senior patients with comorbidities. They probably have an anesthesiologist on board. So it's an option is don't be afraid to do it. Make sure that you have a buddy. And this is something that is so important in dentistry is that you always, have a dedicated anesthetist present, somebody who is actually monitoring that patient for whoever's cleaning. It can't be anymore where we did dentistry in the back of the room by ourselves um, because the only time I knew something was wrong was when my tongue went, my animal's tongue went blue. Um, we have to constantly monitor that patient. And that is more than just having a, a monitor hooked up to them because they're behind what's actually happening in the patient. Make sure somebody's actually laying hands on and listening to their heart and checking on them on a regular basis. And then blocks. If you aren't doing dental nerve blocks, please learn how to do them. Um, there's tons of labs out. I mean, I teach webinars on placing them and I do in-clinic trainings on them all the time. They're so easy, <coughs> excuse me, and inexpensive to place because we can keep that anesthetic inhalant anesthetic low. My first time placing blocks, we were doing canine extractions and I maintained those patients at less than 1% isoflurane because the block was on board. So they're inexpensive, but they have so much benefit to the patient and they can actually last eight to 12 hours afterwards. And then you can get other pain management on board. Now here, uh, another AHA guidelines um, from 2020, uh, the uh, anesthesia and monitoring guidelines. I would strongly recommend reviewing this uh, in your, your practices because this has got some great information about how important it is that we keep our patients safe under anesthesia. Now, when we look at our senior patients and our older patients, we many times have some type of comorbidity 
uh, along with whatever dental disease we have. We might have renal issues. Um, we might have a heart co conflict. We might even have diabetes mellitus going on. Um, and we may occasionally need to stabilize that patient before we take them to anesthesia. When I was in practice, we always ran what I called surgical safety blood work or pre-anesthetic blood work. And many times my doctor would go, oh, we can't do the procedure. Renal values are elevated. And I'm like, but if we clean that infection up out of his mouth, we could decrease those renal numbers because it's constantly being bombarded by this infection. So, and many times, you know, we were able to do that with doing the dental procedure, reduce those renal values so that we had a more he a healthier patient. Now we make sure that we are treating it, um, treating things like the dental disease can help in diabetes. Okay, and in renal function, as I just mentioned. So we know in humans that people who have periodontal disease are more likely to have diabetes and vice versa. So we wanna make sure we're kind of helping that patient live their best life. We can never put enough emphasis on patient safety though. We really wanna make sure we're keeping that patient as safe as possible. And that means we need to make sure we're doing that surgical safety blood work a CBC, a CAM, possibly even a thyroid on those older patients. You can never underestimate the value of a, a urinalysis um, to evaluate the kidney function, especially in cats, but on any patient, it's valuable information. Possibly even an ECG, chest rads, definitely a full physical examination. And we should really customize our anesthetic protocols. The days of just giving everybody cut bowel, hopefully are long gone. Um, and we are looking at what is going to be in the best interest of this patient based on their medical needs. And again, I can't say it enough that dedicated anesthetist and constant monitoring is so vital. We also have to use balanced anesthesia. And that means we're going to use multiple different drugs because what we're doing then is we're going to minimize the drug's bad effects, but we're gonna maximize their benefits. All right, so this again has to be tailored to the specific animal. So, you know, we definitely should be using some type of pre-medication or sedation drugs. It helps that patient just be less anxious. When a patient is less anxious, we have a, a smoother anesthetic time with that patient. So making sure we're giving some kind of pre-medication and, and sedation prior to the procedure can make a huge difference. We also need to keep in mind that we should do preemptive analgesia. Dental procedures hurt, okay? Even just getting my teeth cleaned, I'll take an ibuprofen because I know my gingiva is gonna be a little inflamed and a little sore. So it's gonna hurt no matter what. And if you're doing a surgical extraction, it hurts. So we need to have preemptive analgesia on board prior to the procedure. That's going to not only help our patient be more comfortable along with the blocks, but it's also gonna make them, you know, just have a little bit better anesthetic time. Some of the options out there, midazolam, um, diazepam, acepromazine, you know, dexdomator, or excuse me, dexamedetomidine. Um, these guys are gonna be there and they're gonna have a profound effect when we're using opioids. Now, when it comes to what opioid to use, that again is the veterinarian's choice. All right, but there are better choices than others. And some of the poor choices for pain, especially dental pain, is uh, butorphanol. It's not a very strong pain management system. It's like kind of throwing an aspirin at a broken leg, all right? It's not going to be very, very effective. It's not, and it can actually block other opioid effects. So make sure you're looking and researching what is going to be my best option for pain management. Buprenorphine is one we use forever when I was in practice. And we know that it can actually block other opioids effects. And it's really not as strong as we once thought. Now it can be added to the bibivacaine for nerve blocks. And it's a very micro, micro amount. It's like 0 0.0003 megs per kg. Um, so it's really teeny tiny amount. Um, it can be added to the, the bibivacaine um, with the blocks. Um, and it's gonna maybe make that block last more than you know, 24 hours. So just kind of keep that in mind. I've already mentioned blocks, but they're so easy to place. Everybody's really afraid of them, but blocks can be very easy to place. There's a ton of different ways to do them. I teach probably the safest way um, from 
the ways that I've, you know, seen other people do blocks, but I know they're effective because I can maintain those patients at a very low anesthetic rate. They're inexpensive. The equipment you see there, the Marcane, a syringe and a couple needles, three or four needles is all that takes to place the blocks. Okay, we always wanna use a sharp new needle when we're placing blocks. And if you ever need training on doing nerve blocks, you know, reach out to me, I'm happy to find you training. We do them at every major conference. There's a blocks uh, lab or usually some type of block. I'm doing one at Western Vet Conference, um, but I also do in-clinic trainings on how to place these as long as, and also webinars. We also need to make sure these older patients are hydrated. Our dental procedures are longer procedures, okay? Especially when we're looking at grade stage three or four periodontal diseases. It's not unusual to have a three hour procedure. I know that that's probably making it cringe a little bit, but it is not unusual because we do need to clean and we need to do extractions. So we wanna make sure we always have an IV catheter on board that we're administering warm fluids to that patient. And that means that we want that that line warm right before it goes into the patient, not three feet up on the line where we have the warmer. We need it right as it goes into the patient. So we're administering warm fluids. Sometimes we need to preload the fluids um, if indicated. And we always need to make sure we're monitoring their kidney output and watch for signs of overhydration on the patients. Another really important part of maintaining our patient's health is body temperature. A patient who is hypothermic when they wake up is going to have a slower recovery time and possibly even have pathological hypothermia. So we want to make sure we keep our patients warm during an anesthetic protocol. And when we're doing dentistry, we're running copious amounts of cold water into their mouth. Well, that's how dogs and cats cool themselves by panting, right? So if we're running cold water into their mouth, we're decreasing that body temperature a lot. So we wanna make sure we keep them warm and dry during the procedure. Now, <clears throat> obviously, you know, temps below um, 98 degrees can start causing mentation issues, cardiac function, and even affect healing. Now, the picture here is of a hot dog system and, and I'm not getting paid by hot dogs. So, um, but I really like this system because it doesn't make me hot. I can burrito my patient in much like the little dog on the top is. Once I started using this system in practice, I never had a patient wake up under 99 degrees. Um, you know, and that was sometimes three or four hour procedures. The only thing I would change in this picture, if I had my option, I wouldn't put their head on a towel because when we have that patient's head on a towel and we're cleaning the teeth, that towel's getting wet and it's wicking that moisture up onto their body and cooling them off. So I would have maybe a towel underneath kind of part of their head, but have the mouth off over the grate so that the water is running out and it's keeping my patient dry. Other things you can do if you don't have a body warming system like this is warm towels, um, rice um, bags, uh, making sure that the towels are constantly being rotated and warm, cover both on top and below, just putting them on a heated uh, water blanket isn't gonna be enough. You need to make sure you're keeping them uh, warm on top. You can even put little baby booties on their feet to help maintain the heat. There's a lot of different ways we can try to keep these patients warmer under these longer anesthetic times. So as I said, procedure length, you know, we really do want to try to keep it under three hours if we can. That means we might need to stage procedures. So if we have a dog or cat who needs full mouth extractions, we might need to really think about what we're gonna do. And maybe we perform the COHAT, which is a comprehensive oral health assessment and treatment to get the infection under control. That means we're gonna do that cleaning and the oral exam, find out what we need to do, clean the teeth up, get that infection at least somewhat under control. And then if we need to schedule additional times, um, we can, you know, maybe there's multiple extractions or something, we can do that at another procedure three, four, five weeks down the road, okay? But when we do this, and I know you guys are shelters, but if you are doing this for a client-owned animal, you wanna make sure we're setting them up with those expectations that there's a possibility there might be additional procedures, especially for those really horrible mouths. Now, when it comes to recovery on our patients, you know, it's not that once they're done, we just throw them in a cage and let them go. We need to make sure we're monitoring their pain. We make sure we're giving them pain management because those extractions hurt. 
And, you know, think about when you've had your wisdom teeth taken out or whatever procedure you might have had done, it hurts for a while afterwards. So keeping them on an anti-inflammatory and possibly even another type of drug um, for a three or four days post-procedure can be really important. Um, and the blocks, as I said, blocks can help maintain that pain management for, you know, 12 hours and maybe even longer if you add, you know, buprenorphine to your block. We also want to maintain those fluids until that patient is discharged or until they're fully awake. We don't want to just, as soon as they're off the table, pull the fluid bag. Um, we want to make sure we're monitoring them. We're keeping an eye on their hydration level, but we want to keep those fluids going, especially in our senior cats, um, that we want to make sure we're hydrating them as much as possible. And then we have to monitor them. And that means we're monitoring them very closely, um, looking at urine output, checking their body temperature. We don't want them to become hypothermic or bradycardia. Um, we wanna make sure we're keeping that patient. If it's a patient you're sending home, make sure that the pet owner is checking on that patient multiple times a day, not the cat that goes home and hides under the bed and the owner hasn't seen it for three days post a dental procedure. That's a recipe for, for disaster right there. We have to make sure our pet owners are checking on that patient. So what are some of the common pathologies we see in, in our senior pets? Now, some of the stuff here may not always have to be a senior, um, fully disclose that. But one of the things we can see is severe bone loss. Um, this is, you know, three different pac patients here, but we have severe bone loss. And this is why x-rays are so vitally important when we're doing dental procedures, because if I didn't know that that canine, there's very little bone left on there, and my doctor just went in and cranked that out, we have a broken jaw, okay? So we want to make sure we know what's happening beforehand. Um, same with this molar. I mean, there's very little cortical bone below that, and we're going to have a serious issue with an extraction there. So we want to make sure we know what's happening with an x-ray before we extract, and then also afterwards. Make sure you got everything out. Gingiva stomatitis, yes, this can be a younger patient disease too. We can see it in older patients. It's chronic. It's extremely painful. We should rule out, you know, leukemia and FIV as well as I think there's a link and it's starting to become a little bit more research done on a link between stomatitis and Khaleesi virus in cats. Um, dogs do get stomatitis also. So just keep that in mind. Um, unfortunately, really the only way to truly treat this to effectively is full mouth extractions. And that means we follow up with a, um, a x-ray after the extraction to make sure we didn't leave any dentin. Um, there's kind of two rules of thought on gingiva stomatitis. Is it an allergic reaction to the plaque or is it an allergic reaction to, you know, autoimmune reaction to the dentin? Um, I have seen it where all the teeth have been removed. We've done great. Everything is healed up at one site. We follow up with a better x-ray and we find a little piece of tooth in there. Well, piece of tooth root. You can take it out and we have complete recovery. Now that's only 80% effective. Some of these patients, we just have to keep on some type of a corticosteroid the rest of their life to make them comfortable. <clears throat> when it comes to tooth resorption, um, we used to call this feline odontoclastic resorption, um, but now it's just um, tooth resorption because we do see it in dogs and cats. And there's five stages. Um, all of these stages are painful. Uh, well, four of them are painful. The last one isn't as painful because it's kind of over. Um, but these are going to be based on the degree of involvement on the crown. And then we need to look at the x-ray to see how do we treat it. And if we see the periodontal ligament like I do on this type one over here in the picture, where I can see that black line of the periodontal ligament, this is an extraction. If the tooth root is absorbed and we don't see a ligament anymore, we can't even make out a root, we can do a crown amputation. And of course the type three is one that has a little, one root is type one, one root is type two. If you want more information on this, you can go to the abdc.org website and they have a, a under, under nomenclature on there that has all the pictures of the different stages of, of uh, tooth resorption. We do see it in, in dogs and I don't think, I mean, I'm seeing it more and more in dogs, and I don't think they're trying to become cats. I just think we're taking many more x-rays than we ever used to. 
And we are in, in veterinary medicine, if it's like the resorption I see in that red circle, um, we can do a wait and see on a dog. If I saw that in a cat, it's gone, okay? Um, but if we see that in a dog, we can wait and see because we know that it doesn't hurt until it hits the gingiva or until it, it hits the crown. Once it hits the crown, it's painful, okay? And in a dog, it may never progress or it progresses extremely slowly. In a cat, it progresses fairly quickly. So just kind of keep that in mind. We also see alveolar bone expansion in our older kitties. And this is those cats who have that very bulbous or bulging appearance on their maxillary canines. This is due to chronic inflammation, chronic infection of that bone above the, the, the gingiva. Now we always should biopsy this, make sure it's not some type of neoplasia, but a lot of times this is just due to chronic periodontal disease. And when we treat these, it is extraction, a biopsy and remove all of that necrotic bone. If I just pulled the tooth out, it's never gonna heal and it's just gonna to continue to be a nidus for infection. So they have to go in and remove all of that necrotic bone. But in conjunction with this, we get maxillary canine extrusion. And that's when there's basically long in the tooth, right? The tooth appears longer than it really is. Might think it's increased gingival recession, but instead that necrotic bone is pushing the tooth out of its socket. Um, this can cause lower trauma to the lip, all right? So we want to make sure we're treating these guys, and that involves an extraction. We can also see discolored teeth, and this can be in puppies or animals of any age, um, but we want to make sure whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic. Extrinsic is when we have just stain on the tooth. Intrinsic is when it's due to an injury inside of the tooth called pulpitis, where the pulp has started to bleed. And what happens is it turns purple, and then after the gets older, it turns kind of brown, gray, or a different color. Um, it, we very rarely are these reversible, okay? Um, and when we see these, we now say extract or have a root canal done on them. We used to say, wait and see and watch it. Many times they do abscess and our patients can't tell us when it hurts. So it's better just to you know have that tooth removed or have it root canaled. Another thing we see in our older patients are fractures. And these can be enamel. This is an enamel infraction. This really is just something you make a note of. There's not much you can do about it. Um, for some reason, underneath the enamel, we have some cracks. If I took an explorer, I'm not gonna feel those cracks. Okay, they're just there. So this is an enamel infraction. But when we have uh, uncomplicated fractures, that's when we do not have pulp exposure. Say we would probably refer to these as you know, slab fractures, right? Okay. And when we see this, we need to make sure we are possibly treating that because now we have exposed dentin. Dentin is sensitive and rough and going to create more of an issue down the road. These could be treated with a bonded sealant if you have the training and the equipment to do that. Now, once we get to complicated fractures, those are going to need to probably have a root canal or extraction. This means the pulp is exposed. So on that canine on the top picture, the pulp is exposed. That black stuff we see in there is something called tertiary dentin that's laid down and it's protecting the tooth. It wants to heal itself, right? But what it's done is it had trapped that bacteria into the pulp chamber. And that bacteria has two options. It can die or it can continue to proliferate and lead to that abscess tooth. So we need to make sure we're always evaluating these teeth. Now, the, the picture on the bottom is a complicated crown root fracture that is probably not anything we can do except get that tooth out of the mouth. We also see root fractures. And these are when we have maybe a mobile incisor and we think, oh, it's mobile incisor, probably bone loss. But when we take an X-ray, it's actually a fractured root. So these, obviously the tooth should be removed along with that extra root piece. We do see caries in dogs. Um, as opposed to tooth resorption, these are actually truly cavities, uh, tooth decay. Um, it's going to be on these back molars where they have kind of a flat occlusal surface. It's not very common. I think I've seen like three or four cases in all my years. Um, it's fairly uncommon. However, we do see it more commonly in dogs who eat a lot of carrots, probably because of the sugars in the carrots. Uh, dogs don't have the same pH as we do, so we get caries. We either have the pH in our mouth for the bacteria that cause caries, 
or the bacteria that cause periodontal disease. In dogs, they probably have more of the, the periodontal disease, more so than the cavities. But these can be treated with rest a restoration, cleaned out and, and uh, fixed if, if we find them. We also see abrasion and abrasion is from a foreign object. Okay, external object. And this patient here, it's a tennis ball. If you imagine just placing a tennis ball in his mouth, you can see where it has worn those teeth down. And that's because tennis balls are rough. They're kind of like chewing on sandpaper all the time. So it's okay to play fetch with tennis balls, but just make sure the dog doesn't chew on it nonstop. Okay. Also, we see this in cage chewers, as well as even animals who have skin issues and are constantly chewing on their leg or their skin, they can wear away their incisors due to abrasion. Now, attrition is where from tooth on tooth. That's when during a malocclusion, we have the teeth contacting each other. So for example, that third maxillary incisor is hitting that mandibular molar, or excuse me, mandibular canine, and it's causing a wear on both of them. And these can be painful. So we wanna make sure we're addressing these issues. We also see oral and gingival masses in our senior patients. Uh, we can see them in younger too, but in our senior patients are more than likely gonna see one. And we need to make sure that we <clears throat> look at the entire mouth. It's more than just the teeth. We wanna look at the oral pharynx. We wanna check inside the tongue or inside the cheeks, under the tongue, and just look everywhere. If we find something, we need to biopsy it. We can't just look at something and say, that is cancer, okay? We need a biopsy. This, there's kind of a rule in veterinary dentistry that if it looks bad, it's probably not. If it looks eh, not so bad, it's probably horrible. This, however, looks bad and is bad. This is a melanoma, all right? Um, but sometimes we just have those epulis, right? Those little extra growth of tissue. Now they can actually be bad. They can be an acanthomosis ameloblastoma. So we wanna make sure we're looking at it and they can cause a lot of destruction. We also have gingival enlargement, you know, or what we used to call hyperplasia on our boxers and some of our breeds, or we get oral masses. So we always need to biopsy whenever we see a mass. Most common mass in cats is gonna be a squamous cell carcinoma. Again, senior patients at 11 to 13 year age is kind of the median range. Um, it's the most common one we see in cats. Many times it's underneath the tongue, um, but it can be anywhere in the mouth. Second most common tumor in cats, dental tumor is gonna be a fibrosarcoma. And even though it's the second most common, they're very rare, okay? You do not see them very often. And again, it's in older animals and it's gonna be more in the rostral area of their mouth that we start to see this problem that we, we have the proliferation of fibrosarcomas. We can also get contact mucocytosis or ulceration. We used to call this CUPS, chronic ulcerative periodontal stomatitis. Um, you'll learn in veterinary dentistry, we change the name about every five years just to keep everybody on their toes. But this is when we have, part of the tissue is constantly hitting the infected area. Okay, so in this situation back on that back molar on that cat, it's constantly hitting that plaque and bacteria on the tooth. So it's causing kind of a, a, a alteration on the gingival tissue. Sometimes the only way to treat this is tooth removal. Um, the other one on the other side here is osteomyelitis and that's just a, excuse me, bone infection. We see draining tracts on our patients. Um, these can be, a lot of times it'll be under an eye. Maybe they came in with what I always joke about is bee string syndrome where they have the big swelling, or we see like this patient that it actually was an abscess that kind of blew through and started to drain. This patient had been treated with pulse therapy by another veterinarian. I'm like, we just need to get that tooth out guys. Um, and then that dog healed up just fine. Cats don't always have the fistulas like we see in the dog, but they get draining tracts. Um, and it's kind of important that we know where that infection is because this guy actually, you think it'd be the canine, but it was actually the third premolar that was abscessed. So we never really know for sure where it's coming from until we get an x-ray. Again, I mentioned earlier oral nasal fistulas. Um, we see this very commonly in dachshunds. Sometimes other toy breeds also get them. Where we start having on especially the palatal aspect of a maxillary canine, we'll have so much bone loss that we have direct con uh, connection between the sinuses and the aural cavity. These have to be surgically repaired. Otherwise that animal is gonna constantly have chronic 
um, nasal issues. So making sure that we do an annual COHAD or comprehensive oral health assessment is important that we start early on our patients because it is prevention we want to do. We don't want to wait till the patient's at stage three or four and they already have bone loss. We want to prevent that from happening. We want to prevent that severe infection. We want to keep that patient having all his teeth as long as possible. And we want to prevent those systemic infections. This is one of my girls. She's been gone for a few years now. She's the one with polyimmunated arthritis. Um, when I ended up having to um, have her euthanized, I kind of looked at my doctor and I said, it's so sad because her teeth are in perfect shape. Um, she had every tooth in her head. She was 11 and she didn't even have gingivitis um, because we did everything we could to keep her mouth healthy because I knew she had all the other issues going on in her poor little body. Um, but it can happen. Dogs do not need to lose teeth because they're old. Okay. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the ACC dental loop. And this is kind of a new technology that's out, not new technology, but a new product that's out that is being used in dentistry. And what it does is it helps reduce the dental pain and the inflammation. And it's using targeted pulse magnet, excuse me, um, electromagnetic field therapy. And what that's doing is getting those electromagnetic waves that are targeted at specific areas. So when we hold this loop over the animal's face, it can actually reduce the swelling and pain after a dental procedure, or even before sometimes if it was, you know, some kind of trauma or something. Um, it reduces the need for opioids and other pain medications. It may not totally replace them, but it can reduce the amount that's needed. Uh, it can even be there to prepare the tissues for oral surgery. So it's something to consider uh, to have these. These loops are really cool. They have about 60 uses in one loop. 